We've got uh, roughly um, we've got roughly uh, 50 minutes before the museum will throw us out. So um, questions on the back of anything throughout the day, um, anything that wasn't understood properly, or any clarifications. The floor is open to you all. Oh. There was this one question from the gentleman who was asking about our stance of the new Austrian school on, let's say, a political issue of, of government. Was that correct? That's absolutely right. Yeah. right. Maybe you, I'll, I'll let you reformulate yeah, your question. Yes. Good, 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 good. Uh, yeah, I think it was something that Sandeep said. I was basically posing the question as to whether or not you felt that the entire uh, control and production of money should be in private hands or whether the government has a role to play in providing a uniform, consistent standard which is acceptable across the country. Because I feel that if you were perhaps a preemptive enough, if, if you were to say it, it, it has to be private, but possibly you're going out on a limb which would uh, um, not attract too much support. I've got no problem with the state saying these are nice coins, we've made them, go ahead and use them. But if there's sort of some kind of tender law against that, then that's what would be... If, the, if, if state coins were, uh, were put on the same pedestal as Coca-Cola coins, you know, then sure, if the state's coins are of, a, of that nature, they'll, they'll win and they'll circulate. Mm. But there shouldn't be any compulsion for people to, uh, to, 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 to use state coins. No. But it's a big enough uh, you know, concept for the ordinary people to get their head around that mm. money is, if they think it's money, it's not money at all. Mm. And to then to go another step and to say, well, actually it shouldn't, be, shouldn't even be in the hands of the government is something that just completely blows them away. Rudy? The actual money is not in the hands of the government, it's in the hands of the miners. They're going to dig out gold and make the money. And the government at best mints it into government approved coins. But how much they mint depends on how much gold is being presented to the mint. So that's the close the loop. And the only time miners dig the gold out is if they make a profit, a gold profit. If it costs nine gold units to dig out ten gold units, they'll do it. Around, forget it. No gold. I'll give you a good example, actually. Um, if you compare the past 2,000 years of history in Europe and 2,000 years of history in India, you'll see that the, the, the rupee, if I, if I brought you a rupee from the 10th century, it was exactly the same weight and Finest, more or less, as a rupee from the 15th century. It's a gold coin? No, silver. 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 It's a, an 11 gram silver coin. And it was exactly the same weight and fineness, um, or exactly the same silver content, 11 grams plus or minus a little bit, all the way from the 6th century up until 1919. You know, um, and if you think about all of the the problems that India had over two, for the past 2,000 years of, of history, the one thing that they didn't have a problem with was changing the, the thing behind the name rupee. It was always 11 grams of silver. And you can actually take it back further, although it wasn't called a rupee then, to the Indus Valley, where you have uh, their, their rectangular punch-marked coins, which were in 11 grams or 5 grams. And the punch marks just signified the, the who made that thing and its purity, basically. It's, it's just a, a sort of a stamp of approval. So you've got a continuous history of a 5-gram silver coin and an 11-gram silver coin, which was later called a rupee, which remained as a rupee and allowed India to sort of flourish. Um, but if you compare what was done in Europe over that period, they just kept on changing what a denarius, what a pound was, you know, left, right and center. So instead of, um, the, the Roman way of debasing was just to add more copper or whatever to the mix and make more coins. You know, and they realized that by 
so, so by, by let's say early, the early medieval period that that way of debasing your money is very quickly noticed by the people <laughs> you know so instead of changing it that way you can change you can just make the coin smaller so a, a shilling a shilling which is about uh, a five gram coin or was a, a five gram sterling silver coin up until 1919 was originally um, a 12 gram silver coin the shilling you know so <coughs> You can compare quite easily. That's what you can do if you're dishonest, and that's what you can do in India if you're honest, basically. Um, would I like to rely on a state to be honest? You know, well, I live in England, you know, and I don't live in Germany, you know, so I, I probably, I wouldn't rely on the state, frankly. You know, um, but didn't it work quite well from the stand, the um, uh, confirmation of the standard of gold and, and the monetary unit in England from 1717 when uh, yeah. uh, uh, Isaac Newton... Uh, so they had the mistake there of, 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 of having the wrong gold-silver ratio. Not that there's a right one, but they had a fixed one. Um, but that the caused all of us... Pretty well in the UK. From there onwards, it, it, it did. You know, if you look at English coins from, let's say, they didn't put the one guinea or one sovereign or one shilling on them. They just minted them. And you knew that it was called a shilling or a sovereign or whatever, you know. So it was like we were almost there. The state was willing to not even give these coins names, as it were, only for sort of historical purposes or just bookkeeping or something. But then you had sort of all of the First World War, Second World War, all of those wars in the late 19th century as well, you know, and the pinnacle was reached, as Rudy pointed out, 1912. You can look at the volume of global trade, you know, and it, it didn't get back to those levels until, until the early 70s. Actually, if I may put in one historical word, Britain has always been on a silver standard. Ever since medieval times and the early medieval um, princes had a good practice of, as far as I understand British coins, of, of renewing every seven years, or, uh, practically, and they, they fixed the worn coins. Somehow, the wear, wear, and the wear and tear was fixed at the, ex well, I don't know at whose expense, but anyway, it was maintained until it was disused, and they so had, the, the, the silver coins in Britain were so worn out, they stumbled by accident, or by default, to, go. to a gold standard. So there you go. Good government, as as against you know bad maintenance of or, or, or you know bad governance. You see, one of the things that you can do with a worn coin in that environment is take it to the mint for a uh, as long as it's within these parameters, you can exchange it for a, a proper coin. But if you take that concept, so let's say you're allowed to call this a shilling as long as it's five grams, you know, up to ten percent error. There's a tolerance. There's a tolerance. Yeah, and you that know. is the original meaning of the word legal tender. tender yeah. If it was within the tolerance, mm -hmm. you were obliged to accept it as if it was a full-bodied coin. Already it was, although it was already worn. So that is ridiculous. I mean, I, what would you do as soon as you got a new coin? You just clip 10% off of it because you can use it for the same, you know, so as but soon as the state... They didn't clip... The, the word is sweating. Yeah. That means you put the coins in a bag and shake them until the uh, small bits collect at the bottom, and that's your profit. That's okay. your profit. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's legal, though. I mean, if if they say you've got a tolerance, there's nothing. They said you're not allowed to do that, and there's a, obviously, you know, but people will do it. You know, you've given a dogmatic tolerance. You've given a rule, people will go around the rule. And it's no, they use the rule. It's a stupid rule. It's a stupid rule, you know. So I think in principle, yes, but in practice, 
they just come up with sort of silly um, <laughs> addendums. I want to make some Rudy? comments on your presentation. Okay. Uh, Rudy, yeah, sorry. Yeah, I heard, a, I don't know if it's a rumor or not, that there was some uh, legal move against gold in Britain. I know Roosevelt in the U.S. confiscated the American citizens' gold, but I heard lately that something like this happened in Great Britain in the 50s, that people were not allowed to hold gold or, or had to give it in or something. Does anybody know anything about that? Or heard anything like this? I'll check. A bit before my time, but um, <laughs> I'll check. Okay. Okay. A dead? We have a friend who uh, bemoaned the fact that his mom bag the two tons of big uh, baby powder tins mm. into the government. Food right. So his dad was saying. So there was, yeah. There, yeah there was a, yes, there was a written issue. Um, two government officials came around to their house and said, you have to hand in the gold coins. We believe you're uh, in possession of them. And she, hand, she went and she went down to the some local government uh, uh, building and handed in the two large paintings full of gold coins. The other sister, um, my friend's aunt, did not. Mm. Um, and this was the inheritance from their father. Right. So one family ended up being quite tremendously wealthy as they are now, and the other one, my friend's, um, not so happy. Oh gosh, <laughs> I didn't know about that. That's, that's scary. <laughs> that's scary. That's why I heard it. So I have to bring it up. I need to hear something more about that. Okay. So is this an example of do not listen to government officials? Yes? Dry wrong conclusions. Well, um, uh, you know, the, 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 there is a stance, of course. Let me play a little bit of advocate of the devil here. People, and this is more anthropology. Um, anthropology as a science, you know, that studies how communities form and why they form and how it works. Now, people have a tendency to over, well, who doesn't know trouble? Who doesn't know problems? We all have to overcome certain problems in our lives. Those who don't have problems, raise their hands. Okay, so we all have problems. And in group, if we organize properly, we can overcome certain problems. That's why we can have um, communities living together, we can have larger communities, we can have layers and layers and um, until we get to the federal community or a country or um, European unions and S United States, well, all those layers and layers and layers, those are, I think, um, well-intended solutions to a problem that had occurred in the past, but the problem has been solved and the thing is, of course, <laughs> the, bu the bureaucracy is still there. <laughs> it should have been dissolved. It should have been, I mean, abolished as soon as the problem was gone. Then there's no need for whatever mechanism that had solved the problem. That's why I don't believe in standing armies all that much because they cost them, they, they're a drain on anyone's pocket. But there may be a legitimate reason for having a standing army, I'm not arguing with that. So, so from, from an anthropological point of view, organization, spontaneous organization, not imposed, eh? spontaneous organization, I agree, we would need that to overcome certain problems. It is what made the walls around old London, the inner cities of all those medieval cities, that's what that's how people got walls around. Not by you and me laying bricks, but by all of all of us together at living at that time. Coordinating our effort, which was a good effort and it, it kept out bandits. But do we need do we need more complexity? I doubt it. Once, once the problem's solved, it's solved. Deal with it. It's over. You, you, you can. I understand that society continues to create one problem after another, and every uh, problem enables bureaucracy to grab and to gain bigger slices of control and power. That seems to be the history of society to me. Well, there are even there are even um, the so-called conspiracy theorists who who would argue that. 
certain people in government create problems so they can have a chance and jump at it to, to solve it for you? I don't know. I'll, I'll, keep, I'll keep just to anthropology here. All the rest is a bit of politics and you will recognize it when you, get, when you see it. It is easily recognizable when a problem is a false problem. So, um, in fact, this, is, this would, would be my contribution to your problem or, or, or your question. Do we believe in government? Some of us don't. Um, I don't force you. I, I, I think there are occasions where spontaneous formation of, of temporary authority is legitimate and will help in overcoming problems and of course the world is full of problems and will always be forced to overcome problems even if it is only the weather or each other. Brian, you had a question. No, it was more of a suggestion that you're either talking about private control of mint or state control of mint but in a way another her angle coming at it would be some sort of open source community of verification of knowledge, whereby all those involved in it would, much like developing software or something, are only interested in the end product being as good as it can be. Mm. So then it would be mostly monetary or what? Sort of a angle <coughs> I'm going to add to that too. Yep. I, I don't think it's government per se that we need or don't need. We need discipline. There has to be discipline to coordinate things. And the question is, is it self-discipline or is it imposed discipline? There will be discipline. Yeah. So if it's self-imposed, if people see the right thing mm. to do and do it, the community or whatever, it gets done. If they don't, somebody will push them and whoever is pushing it will say, hey, I can do this and I can do more and I can keep that bureaucracy growing and getting bigger and more painful and so on. So there has to be this. Professor? Just say that I'm going to comment. Okay, on yeah, pro uh, Professor just has some comments on, on my presentation on the origin, <coughs> on the origin of interest. Uh, so, we'll get back to questions um, after that. Uh, might be to bring up the old... Well, basically, here are about two schools on the theory of interest. This down here is the time preference school. And up there is the productivity school. <coughs> the productivity school of interest. Now, these two schools of interest were at each other thoughts very, very peculiar. That, uh, go, that goes way, way back to the Middle Ages when these theorizers started to speculate what causes interest, why does interest exist. And they always approached the problem antagonistically. And what is amazing and what came out in uh, Sandeep's presentation that actually you can <coughs> excuse me uh, have a synthesis of the two schools a synthesis that's just amazing and really it's Manger's approach which brings this out because Manger in the in his origin of money actually laid out the origin of interest. This is exactly the same approach. 
exactly the same approach. Now, in my uh, way of presenting this, the way I do it uh, is that I refine the concept of marketability. There is marketability in the large and that's the easy part because this this is exactly as as Menger himself used the word marketability we just call it marketability in the large because now we introduce the innovation. We are going to talk about marketability in the small. So that's the new thing and it's a little bit more difficult to understand, not much more, because mathematically the picture is very symmetric. <clears throat> you look at this. Actually, I erase what I don't need. Now we are talking about the bid-ask spread. So this is the ask <coughs> or offer, and that's the bid. Okay, and it's as we have discussed already, and is very easy to understand. The spread is increasing with increasing quantity. If greater and greater quantities of the material, which is going to be the monetary commodity, gold and silver, as the quantity which goes to the market increases, the spread is also increasing. And it's not just for gold and silver, it's everything. It's a universal fact that with the increase of quantity, the spread is increasing. And then, of course, the next question is for what? Commodity is the increase, the smallest, the lowest rate is going to give you the most marketable good. Okay? That's what we have done, discussed already in, in, in detail. But now, there is another question. The question is, what happens to the spread if the quantity is decreasing? You see? A lot of people might think that it, the spread is decreasing, but actually the chart which Sandy put up here is correct, because the spread will increase with lower and lower and lower quantity. The way to visualize it is think of the pharmacist. The pharmacist has very, very fine scales, can measure fractions of a gram or fractions of a, even of a, a milligram sometimes. Or today we certainly have uh, instruments which can make these. The question is, what happens to the spread 
when the quantity is decreasing and that is the surprising thing the answer the spread is going to increase the same as in the case of the increasing quantity and obviously everybody is curious to know why is the spread increasing when the quantity is decreasing and the answer is that those instruments which the pharmacist not today because what does a pharmacist do today <laughs> gives you the packaged pre-packaged medicine and holds the hand for the payment, that's all. But that wasn't the case 200 years ago. The pharmacist had to be a chemist. In many cases he was called a chemist and he worked with very, very fine instruments. And these instruments were expensive. So if you wanted to buy or sell very, very small quantities, you had to be prepared to have the instruments and that took a, a lot of investments, capital. It was a very capital extensive uh, trade to be a chemist, a pharmacist. And for that reason, and then you can go through the details of the argument, the spread couldn't shrink with shrinking quantity, it had to increase because the smaller the quantity, the more expensive it was to determine the exact weight or quantity. And that is the reason. Now, this has very important implications because the same way <coughs> Menger developed his theory of marketability in the large, we can develop theory of marketability in the small. You see? And that's what cru is crucial in the case of interest. Why is it crucial? Because Sandy was talking about converting income into wealth. Typically a young person needs that because he has to save capital or if he just started a family he has to save money for his uh, for the education of his offspring or retirement funds for himself and for his spouse and that means converting income into wealth so that later when they are getting old, they can convert the wealth back into income. So visually this means a chunk of gold which was built up piecemeal, little by little added, and then you could have a gold bullion of any form. But the important thing is, without any loss, or with minimizing the losses, you can convert it back into income simply by carving, shaving off bits of gold and selling as you need it. Okay? Far better way than relying on your so-called so social security in the United States which is already bankrupt and uh, no guarantee that a couple of years down the road they can continue to be spared and in any other country in Europe and so on. So at the very bottom of this question there is this idea of marketability in the small. So I'm just saying this because the theory of interest is strikingly similar to the, I'm sorry, origin of interest, which is the title of Sandeep Stock, is surprisingly very similar 
marketability in the large, which explains the origin of money. How money came to be. And, and that parallel I am offering to you, which is a, an amazing example to my mind, that people didn't discover it long before I came along. I mean, Menger died in 1921. All this theory was laid out. It was there for everybody to see. And the infight, even within the hard money movement between the productivity school and the time preference school went out. And it was a vicious fight, really vicious. You know, I, I'm not going to the extent to suggest that blood was f flowing, there was jewels, I'm not saying that, but everything up to that level, name-calling, mud-slinging, everything what we can think of. And there was really no reason for that, because all you had to do is copy Manger's theory of money, the origin of money, and you came up with the theory of, of the origin of interest. So I, I want you to take that thought with you, that Manger had a very powerful idea of marketability, but if you refine it, you kill two birds with the one stone. You get origin of money, and you get the origin of interest as well. Okay. Uh, the floor is open to further questions. Right. Well, I, I think, Professor, that um, at least at the time, uh, thinking back to Menger, he had to. He he was he was uh, Austrian from the Austrian. Uh, Empire at that time, yeah. and they were fight. They were basically fighting the German historical school. Yes. And he had to fight the Georg Friedrich Knapp. Knapp, yeah. Am I right? Yeah. Uh, Knapp is his Rocher, He actually accepted first. <laughs> But then this viciousness started with the debate. It, it's called Methodenstreich. Yes. The uh, literally it means the debate on the method, on method. Mm -hmm. This and, is. Uh, but it was a vicious fight between the uh, Menger's movement and the historical school. Uh, I agree that Menger saw it coming. This um, Georg Friedrich Knapp wrote Knapp. a book. Knapp wrote a book about the staatliche Theorie des Geldes. The state, state theory of money. money. He, I mean, th there's no point in saying Menger wasn't his friend. <laughs> <laughs> they were not friends, but they were basically, we all know who won. <laughs> and that is why Menger's library ended up in Japan. That's right. I think. Which it did. I can't prove it, but no. Save here, they died in no, Japan. Keynes, Keynes. Sorry, Professor. Was did the library taken? Did, did uh, Keynes form uh, much of the basis of his state theory of money on now? Yes. He, he, I mean, of course. It wasn't his idea. But it wasn't Knopf's idea either. Huh? No. <laughs> we had this other um, uh, Silvio Yesel. Oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> um, we call them crackpots. Um, because they come up with crackpot ideas. The only one who could really sell it was the first one was Knopf. And then later Keynes, uh, who sold it to uh, Roosevelt. <laughs> Well, yeah. well, the idea is that a chunk of gold is worthless, but if the 
government oh, right. puts a stamp on it all of a sudden. <laughs> <laughs> Lo and behold, We're it becomes ahead. valuable. Yeah. Now, the, the review, the this proof of this was happened in 1971 because as soon as the US dollar became an inconvertible currency its value started falling and the gold's value started going up and the if you follow Knopf's theory of state theory of money it should, be it, it should have gone down just the opposite but the, that is not being taught in school it's heresy yes. the government is omnipotent and by the way Mises has a book by that title omnipotent government yeah. it's a good one I can recommend it. no true absolutely um, and Ludwig von Mises also thought the gold price was going to fall Yes. Uh, yes. Yes. But I think he took it back. <laughs> yeah. Because he lived long enough <laughs> that he saw that it's not going to happen. Well, he actually uh, he had a basis for saying that because that's exactly what happened to With silver. silver. Yeah. So he was just uh, extrapolating the silver experience a hundred years earlier. 1873 or one or whatever uh, that it's going to repeat itself. He said this early, but as things got worse and worse and worse, he corrected himself. So we have to give credit where credit is due. He took it back. Essentially, he took it back. Okay. Unfair. It's it's, it's, <laughs> quarter, it's quarter past. We yep. still need to. So, if there are any more. We've got another 15 minutes. Any more questions? Uh, I, yes. Yep. Sorry, I can make a. Is that market talking about the loan market? Uh, the bond market. The bonds? Yes, yes, the bond market. The gold, the gold, the gold bond market. Oh, the gold bond. Yeah. Um, I will add to this tomorrow because whatever is discussed here as a as, as groundwork. Um, tomorrow morning I will put into a synthesis um, model and afterwards, after that presentation of the model, I will, I will put it back because that model can be used for the gold market as well as for fiat, for credit. And that is, that is the beauty of the model and I mean, it's not, I'm, I'm not as smart as as to say that's my model, um, it's basically the hexagonal model which is in your handouts as a, as, a, as a prerequisite reading. It would, I mean, you don't have to read it. You can just come to the presentation tomorrow and you'll, you'll hopefully you will you'll be able to follow. If not, then stop me. Um, but it makes it easier if you read it first. And then we'll, in the second part, uh, the second discussion is about the the bankruptcy of, of the monetarism and Keynesian systems. I'll, I'll take that m model and apply it. And then you can see for yourself how this whole mess is starting to unravel and what it will lead to. There, I mean, po the power of a model is only tested in, in its predictability. And we'll come to that tomorrow. It's just worth... Um highlighting very quickly about marketability in the large and marketability in the small because I, uh, I imagine not everybody might have got that but try and think about very small quantities of gold you know it's very hard they, the Americans did it they actually produced a gold dollar coin this big or so and they paid wages in it it's not to say that people didn't accept it, you know, they, they accepted it, but... Unpractical. It's a, yeah, it's just not practical. You, you can you lose, lose it, it very easily. You could, yeah. So silver, you know, has a use, you know, which is, which is, which is uh, to accommodate that kind of, um, that kind of transaction. And the exchange between silver and gold 
would ensure the free exchange would ensure that if you have silver, you can still pay a king's ransom. You know, um, they used to. Mm. Still, yeah. But only because you can exchange it for gold, though. Well, I would go even further than that. I would suggest that silver could be defined as the most marketable material in the in the small small better for that purpose than gold. It's not so much true today than it was say 200 years ago when it was still very costly to produce silver and gold in uh, the word is molar molar quantities basically means very very small quantities like the pharmacist could do with his scales. So uh, this is the basis of bimetallism, as if ordered by nature or by God. We have two uh, top quality metals which are eligible for money to be the basis of money. Gold is the most marketable material in the large, and silver is most marketable in the small. And therefore, they are both highly uh, useful for the purposes of making money. Because, for instance, wages could be paid in silver, not very well in gold, because uh, well, what was a the day's basic? wage was that much gold or something? You yeah, know, so. yeah. And, and our, the hourly yeah. wage in the United States was probably around a quarter or at most half a dollar in the good old days, mm -hmm. and uh, therefore there was no way to pay wages in gold. Yet, your sense of justice calls for wages to be payable in in good money. So that's where silver comes in. And the, the British custom, man the money, the queen comes around, I don't know, Easter time, and gives uh, money, silver pennies, silver pennies, to the poor who are lined up. And that's called man the money. And many other examples that silver has a role to play. And the reasonable ratio is around 15, 16 or something in that area. And it was completely distorted. Now bimetallism broke down for one good reason, is that governments came in and said that the ratio between Gold and silver has to be 1 to, to 16, or 1 to 15 and a half, or 1 to 15. Actually, in ancient times, the Persians, I think it was 1 to 13, or even 1 to 10, if you go far enough back. But the point is that it was never fixed. It changed very, very slowly, in historically speaking, very slowly. But that didn't mean that it was fixed or it was constant. And that governments came in like the elephant in the china shop and they said, it has to be 15 and a half. And the Europe swore on one ratio, the United States on another, and so on. And it broke down. It had to because the market moved away from the official mint ratio. And there was just no way to satisfy contracts made in gold or made in silver because the ratio is changing. So the correct answer is not by metallism, <coughs> but uh, a double monetary standard. There has to be a gold standard and a parallel silver standard and a variable ratio and then arbitrage and other uh, transactions 
we will make sure that the uh, the no violent fluctuations. This is a very interesting uh, part of uh, our country, cultural heritage, the history of gold and silver, and it's still an open field because there is very little at the scientific level. I mean, there are all kinds of uh, fairy tales and old, old wives' tales and so on are in circulation. But scientifically speaking, very little has been done on that. So I would encourage young people to, to go into studying the gold silver story. And, uh, and uh, it's, it's really fascinating. So, more questions. Um, we've got about uh, seven minutes for any, any more questions, <coughs> clarifications, or anything like that? Okay. Um, so, tomorrow uh, we have, uh, we're starting at nine o'clock again, we have Peter talking about the synthesis of time preference and productivity schools with Professor John.